నా వీడియో ఆఫ్ లో ఉంటుంది కదా హలో గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ ఎవ్రీబడి వీ విల్ స్టార్ట్ టుడేస్ టాపిక్ ఆఫ్ ద ఫండమెంటల్స్ ఆఫ్ వేవ్ మోడలింగ్ ఐఎమ్ సంధ్య వర్కింగ్ విత్ వేవ్ మోడలింగ్ సో యూ విల్ బి హ్యావింగ్ దిస్ వన్ అవర్ లెక్చర్ ఆన్ దిస్ ఫండమెంటల్స్ yeah uh, though it is a uh, wave model fundamental so i'll be uh, just covering the uh, a few uh, aspects of the general wave uh, related things uh, so this is uh, coming to the physical aspects and scales wave motion is a uh, uh, transport of energy through a material without any significant transport of the material itself so this is the famous diagram by monk uh, <coughs> here uh, there are different kinds of waves you can see um, uh, depending on the the y scale is the energy arbitrary energy scale and x scale is the frequency scale or the period here we will be considering only this part this right side part of this uh, scale uh, because um, here there are uh, waves uh, categories called tides sea shape surges tsunamis infra gravity waves swells wind sea capillary waves so these uh, waves are differ, uh, differing uh, among themselves in terms of their frequencies or periods and energy levels and causative forces etc so tides have very uh, the uh, periods of the order of days a few days uh, uh, or a few hours uh, storm surge also it depends on the geom- uh, <coughs> geometry of the generating wind and um, sea shapes uh, there are uh, it depends on the characteristics of the harbor in which they are formed <coughs> infra gravity waves have periods of a few minutes and uh, this coming to the surface gravity waves wind generated waves uh, are of three types swells wind sea and capillary waves capillary waves are having the highest frequency in this and the so, smallest uh, wavelengths um, so uh, we will be considering only swells and wind sea uh, and these are called surface gravity waves because the uh, the restoring force for these uh, kinds of waves is mainly the uh, acceleration due to gravity whereas capillary waves uh, uh, are uh, restored by mainly by the surface tension so these are very fundamentals uh, just to get a, get a glimpse of this before we enter to wave modeling uh, the uh, cap surface gravity waves are as uh, i already shown you wind seas and swells so uh, wind seas um, are uh, the generated in the area where the wind blows so he- here you can see a diagram schematic uh, where the wind blows over a particular area uh, called fetch the fetch is the unobstructed distance of sea over which the wind blows this is the region where the wind waves are generated and once the wind waves uh, travel from this region and they propagate to other areas they become very organized so they they become like a sine wave they become organized or regular waves uh, the, these regular and long crested waves are called swells whereas the uh, gener- the uh, waves generated at this area where the wind blows they are called wind seas so these waves are segregated in the wave modeling now uh, here i put two pictures of wind seas and swells in the real ocean uh, here you can see the wind sea on the left hand side it is very irregular you see the white caps or white uh, form like uh, kind of things on the left hand side and here the ocean is very organized um, you see regular waves now why the wave data we we are talk going to talk about wave models but why the wave data is required why and where it is required wave data is required for the optimal ship routing and safe navigation so uh, why it is required the ships normally select a route where the waves are uh, not very high not very dangerous waves as well as currents but we are speaking about the waves today 
so uh, for the safe navigation a prior knowledge of the wave uh, condition is a must now for loading and unloading operations in ports and harbors uh, this wave data is required if uh, the wave height is very low the boat may get stuck uh, in the bottom and for maritime activities such as fishing recreation etc wave data is required in coes is giving oise uh, forecast for the fishermen uh, because they want to know wherever the fish is found in abundance whether the ocean is uh, calm or is it okay to go there so all these uh, details are required by the fishing community and for recreation activities also whether it is safe to navigate to those uh, areas so they also require this kind of information now for design of coastal and offshore structures also uh, this prior information is required because uh, the, the you need to know the power of the wave uh, how much energy the wave is having in that particular area uh, so uh, so as to build the structures to withstand that much strength so what is the solution how do we get this kind of wave data incois has deployed a series of a network of wave radar boys which you can see the picture this is uh, all this information is available in the incois website uh, so this wave radar boy this is a uh, picture of the wave radar boy these are uh, deployed along the coastal areas uh, which give the location specific information at these areas at these locations sorry locations and uh, there are moored boys deployed by the national institute of ocean technology chennai uh, ministry of earth sciences government of india which give the kind of information um, the, the wave radar boys also giving they are just the time series of uh, the wave uh, parameters certain wave parameters now satellites of course give a spatial coverage but these two boys give only location specific information where a satellite give a spatial coverage but the main uh, problem with the observations are they are of the past so no predi predictions are possible but numerical wave models can provide wave data with wide spatial coverage they can give the hindcast nowcast or forecast of the sea state so we require the wave, numerical wave models uh, as a solution to the problem now uh, before entering to the uh, wave modeling again we need to uh, recap certain fundamentals so influence of water depth on wave motion is that like when the wave propagates over the uh, uh, ocean surface when the wind blows over the ocean surface waves are formed and uh, the water particles though the, there is no mass transport of uh, the uh, uh, water particles there is a rotational there is a kind of motion uh, of the water particle uh, in the areas where the wave moves wave goes uh, so uh, this is uh, this kind of propagation this uh, kind of water particle motion differs from deep ocean to shallow water like in deep ocean uh, this is a uh, rough definition of the deep ocean wherever the water depth is greater than or equal to wave length by 2 you uh, you uh, mention it as a deep ocean and uh, shallow water is the water where water depth is less than or equal to wave length by 20 and in between it is a transitional depth water now in deep ocean this this is the kind of uh, water particle motion uh, the uh, water particles experience it is a circular and the radius of the circle uh, reduces exponentially when you come down and in shallow water it is elliptical and when the minor axis reduces as you come down and it is it becomes a to and fro motion of the water particle when you come down and uh, this uh, uh what the wave model predicts so it is uh, the numer the statistical properties of the waves are predicted by the numerical wave models and the wave models are based on a concept called wave spectrum uh, we are speaking today only about the phase average models uh, so th uh, these are uh, this wave spectrum uh, is continuously changing in uh, space as well as time and uh, this is the basic uh, thing which is calculated by the wave models but uh, with inputs from the wind and sea bottom or topography or bathymetry you call it and there are optional things also uh, so this wave models predict the wave spectrum accounting for the generation propagation and the dissipation of waves now uh, consider the numerical wave model as a black box uh, so here this uh, boxes give the input wind is an input bathymetry is an input and this dashed boxes 
other optional input tides currents etc the optional inputs initial conditioners were mandatory input and here this boundary condition is also an optional input boundary condition is required only in certain cases where there are open boundaries to other seas now this wave wave model uh, considering it as a black box it accepts these inputs and gives out the outputs such as wave parameters uh, certain some of the wave parameters statistical wave parameters are significant wave height what is significant wave height it is the average of the one third of the highest highest one third of the waves uh, so uh, 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 that is an output from the most of the wave models and wave periods wave direction these are of different kinds of main wave period peak wave period different kinds of periods are there like wave, different kinds of wave directions are there and one dimensional as well as two dimensional wave spectra are also output from the wave models now uh, wave spectrum is the key concept on which the wave models are based upon so uh, here we, we will uh, uh, we'll just explain uh, what is a wave spectrum uh, in a nutshell um, the here you uh, kind of uh, uh, wave record you see a kind of wave record or wave profile uh, at a particular location so uh, this uh, this is the surface elevation at a particular location uh, this could be represented mathematically though i am showing some of the equations we will not be going into the details of any equation uh, those interested can refer to the standard textbooks but just for your understanding uh, this this wave uh, record or wave profile could be uh, reproduced as a sum of a large number of wave components by fourier analysis so these uh, are different fourier components and any any shape the wave profile having any shape could be represented like this as a summation of many harmonic wave components so this is a basic thing uh, from fourier analysis now the variance or energy spectrum is the distribution of the total energy over various frequencies and there are as i already told you there are two kinds of wave spectrum one dimensional spectrum and two dimensional spectrum if it is the uh, distribution of energy over various frequencies it is a one dimensional spectrum if it is distribution of energy over various frequencies as well as directions it is a two dimensional spectrum when you integrate the two dimensional spectrum over different directions you get a one dimensional spectrum all these details are available in te textbooks now uh, for your uh, better uh, understanding here this is a pure harmonic wave this harmonic wave will be having a delta function as a spectrum here you see this is a one dimensional frequency and energy so this is the uh, distribution of energy over various frequencies here there is only one frequency corresponding to this harmonic wave and if this is the surface uh, surface elevation or wave profile uh, this is a modulated harmonic wave um, so it looks looks like periodic but there it's modulated so it gives rise to a narrow spectrum and if this is a this is very irregular and this Uh, gives rise to a wide spectrum so uh, now you must have got a concept of what is, what you mean by spectrum now how the spectrum at re, uh, real spectrum at sea look like this is a picture uh, from the dutch coast uh, taken from a textbook i will give the references at the end of this lecture uh, see this is the uh, observation point uh, in this uh, if you see the observation point there is a local breeze and there is a uh, swell coming from this area here there is a storm which generates uh, waves which when propagate out of this uh, uh, area of the storm it is called swell so at this point there is a local breeze component plus a swell component so at the any location there will be a sea component as well as a swell component if you look at the two dimension spectrum corresponding to this uh, this is the frequency axis and you can see a swell component at lower frequencies and a, a c wind c component at higher frequencies now the swell component is very narrow wind c component is spread as we expect and uh, if the uh, corresponding one dimensional spectrum will look like this so as we expect there are two two peaks one corresponding to the swell peak or another corresponding to the wind c peak now i'll just introduce two model wave spectra there is uh, no need to go through these equations um just for completeness i have put the equations uh, these are two uh, model spectra this one and two so i'll introduce only to there are more spectra but uh, like tma there are many more but uh, these 
two are uh, referred to in many of the wave models. So I'll just introduce these two. One is the Pearson Moscovitz spectrum uh, in 1964. This was uh, based upon a set of 420 observations, uh, wave measurements. Um, uh, so this is the shape of that wave spectrum. Uh, X-axis is the frequency axis, Y-axis is the energy, energy density. Uh, so uh, this this is the shape of that Pearson Moscovitz spectrum. So this will be the uh, kind of distribution of energy um, for a particular uh, condition. This spectrum was uh, observed for a fully developed C stage. What is a fully developed C stage? It is the C state attained when the wind has blown unlimited for with an unlimited fetch. That means the wind is blowing for a long time. The waves have grown fully, and there is no more growth of the waves. So this is the kind of spectrum observed, but this is kind of ideal situation. So the actual situation, real situation is mostly like the wind will be blowing, uh, the wave will be growing. So this is so here also uh, just neglect this uh, equations, uh, but uh, this uh, this is a, uh, another experiment conducted in the North Sea. It's called Joint North Sea Wave Project or Joint Swap. This is the spectrum, this is a very important spectrum. This is the spectrum which most of the wave models use nowadays. This was done in 1973. And uh, this, from these observations, more elaborate observation than the PM's, PM uh, observations, uh, the, they observed that the uh, peak of the spectra is more pronounced. So they, mo uh, they modified the PM spectrum with the uh, 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 peak enhancement factor. The peak enhancement factor was introduced to the PM spectrum to give the John Swap spectrum. So it is observed that in most of the uh, C stage, most of the conditions, uh, ultimately this John Swap spectrum is uh, realized by most of the uh, uh, conditions. So that, that uh, so this spectrum is used for most of the engineering applications. Now, how does a wave model work? The wave model is based upon the energy balance equation with sources and sinks. We, I'll just show the energy balance equation in the coming slide. So uh, this it considers the wave growth by wind, which is a source term. Uh, wave, wave decay due to uh, white capping, bottom friction, depth induced wave breaking, and then nonlinear wave wave interaction, two types, triads and quadruples. We will we will un understand each of these terms in the coming slides. But what is a source term? Source term is the uh, term which adds energy to the waves. And sink term is the terms uh, uh, which drain energy from the uh, waves. And uh, this nonlinear wave wave interactions are different. They are neither uh, uh, adding energy nor subtracting energy. That we will see later. Now, this is a schematic of a regular grid used by a wave model. This is a regular grid uh, means, what is mean, meant by a re regular grid? Here you see the area, C area uh, is divided into grids having uh, finite uh, mean, uh, uh, equidistant longitude and latitude like they are regular grids. Uh, the resolution is constant in the X and Y direction, longitude and latitude directions. So uh, this kind of grid is very easy to set up. Um, and there is another kind of grid, which is an irregular grid. I'll uh, show you towards the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, so this is, uh, in this kind of grid, uh, the spectrum, wave spectrum is calculated at, the, at all the grid points uh, at the same time. It will be like a snapshot. Now, uh, coming to the wave propagation, uh, there is an important uh, relationship called dispersion relationship, which any wave modeler should uh, understand. So the wave propag waves propagate uh, along the great circles, obeying the dispersion relationship. Uh, this great circle are, uh, is the shortest distance between two points on a sphere. These are all great circles. So in deep ocean, essentially the wave uh, waves obey this deep circle uh, routes. They travel towards the deep circle routes. Now, this is the dispersion relationship uh, uh, called as omega square is equal to gk tan h kd. D is the water depth and k is the wave number, which, which are all very fundamental. So I'm go not going to explain all these. Uh, omega is the frequency uh, or rather the angular frequency. And uh, what is dispersion? So dispersion relationship, what is dispersion? Dispersion is the variation of wave speed 
with wavelength. Now, uh, the propagation speed or the phase speed could be readily obtained from the dispersion relationship as uh, g by omega tan hkd or root of uh, equal to root of g by k tan hkd. And now in deep water, omega square is equal to gk. This could be uh, readily obtained from this equation. Omega square is equal to gk because tan hkd uh, approaches 1 in deep water. Uh, and so, uh, because omega square is equal to gk, c is equal to the velocity uh, is equal to g by omega. Speed is equal to g by omega. And in shallow water, omega square is equal to gk square d. And so, c is equal to square root of gd. So now if you look at this uh, final equation, this is the, these are the uh, expressions uh, which are of interest to us. Uh, the phase speed of the wave is g by omega. That means in deep water, the phase speed of the wave depends on the frequency. And in shallow water, it is square root of gd. There is no dependence on the frequencies. All the waves propagate at the sp same speed, but the speed depends on the water depth. So that means deep water is dispersive. Dispersive in the sense different frequencies travel at different speeds in deep water. And shallow water is non-dispersive. That means the wave speed depends only on the uh, water depth. This is a very important concept. So uh, since the deep water, in deep water different frequencies travel at different speeds, the uh, long waves travel faster than the short waves because of this relationship. And thus uh, swells move faster than the wind seas. Now, another concept is the group velocity, which is the velocity at which a group of waves travel. And the wave energy also travels at the group velocity. The expression for that is dou omega by dou k. It's a partial differential equation. Um, and now, in the uh, in deep water, um, this group velocity is equal to half into phase velocity. And in shallow water, group velocity is equal to phase velocity. This much is about the wave propagation. Um, now, coming to the wave refraction, because uh, these are the terms which uh, the uh, equation of uh, the numerical wave model are having. So, uh, you should have a basic understanding of this uh, phenomena. Wave refraction uh, occurs when uh, the wave feels the bottom. There are two types of refraction, current-induced and uh, depth-induced refraction. Uh, now, uh, when the wave enters the transitional depth, if they are not traveling perpendicular to depth contours, the part of the wave in the deep water moves rapidly than the part in the shallow water, causing the crest to turn parallel to the bottom contours or depth contours. So, any change in the wave, wave speed, uh, for instance, due to the gradients of surface currents uh, or uh, due to uh, the uh, depth variations may lead to refraction. So, these are the depth-induced and current-induced refraction. Now, the possible implications of these are the increase in wave height, decrease in wavelength, and decrease in velocity. Now, this is a schematic you will understand better in here. So you see, there is a curve which is shown here. This is the shape. And there is a bay which is shown here. This is a headland. And this is a lighthouse. Okay, now uh, here the depth contours are marked like this and these are the wave crests. So, uh, wherever the depth contours are uh, having uh, an angle with this, uh, a different angle with this wave crest, the waves are turning, the wave crest is turning. And you can see that near a curve or bay, the waves are diverging. So, this refractor wave fronts are here. So, this uh, waves are diverging in these areas and uh, at a headland, uh, the waves are converging. That means uh, the energy gets diffused here and energy gets concentrated in the headlands. So, this is an actual picture, actual photograph of this kind of effect. Here you can see. Now, uh, there is one more uh, phenomena called shawling. This is uh, uh, happening when the water, enter, uh, the wave enters the transition zone. So, the wave bottom begins to uh, drag on the seafloor, causing the waves to slow down. Here you can see this is the deep water. Here, this is the transitional depth and this is the shallow water. Now, when the waves enter the uh, transitional depth, see the waves, uh, the water particles are feeling the bottom. 
Now, since the wave speed is always conserved, I mean, uh, sorry, wave period is always conserved, any decrease in speed is proportional to a corresponding decrease in wavelength. And consequently, the wave energy becomes concentrated, its kinetic energy is converted into the potential energy of a slower, taller wave, and thus the wave height increases. So, in the energy balance equation, there is no explicit term for this, uh, but the, uh, since the energy balance equation, equation is having the group velocity term, so this is implicitly accounted for. Now, this is the energy spectral energy balance equation, which is the basis of any wave model. There will be slight changes according to the wave model, but this is the basis. Uh, and um, there is no need to go through this uh, uh, each term by term uh, or uh, uh, this uh, understand this equation. But uh, what is the role of each of the term? I'll just explain. And uh, here, instead of we were, uh, till now we were speaking about the energy density, now you are seeing N. This N is not uh, the action density, which is nothing but the energy density by the relative frequency. So why this uh, N is considered is because in the presence of currents, wave energy is not conserved, but the wave action is conserved. So uh, in order to have a conserved quantity, uh, they have just replaced uh, the energy density by the action density. Now, the what is the first term? It is a dou by this is a partial differential equation in five-dimensional phase space, sigma, theta, x, y, and t. This is the um, uh, spectral space. Sigma, theta is the spectral space, and x, y is the physical, geographical space, and t is the time. So, first term is the... Uh, uh, it represents the local rate of change of energy density. The second and third terms, these are dou by dou x and dou by dou y. So it is the prop propagation of wave energy in geographical space. Now the third, uh, fourth term uh, is dou by dou theta of uh, this c theta into uh, n. So it represents the depth and current induced refraction. Now the fifth term is dou by dou sigma of uh, this c sigma n. So it rep the fifth term represents the frequency shift due to the variations in depths and currents. So no need to worry about this equation, but this uh, just understand that this is the basic equation in any wave model. And in the on the right hand side you see s of sigma theta x y t by sigma. Actually, this is the uh, sink and source terms which I was talking about in the previous slide. Uh, no need to worry. We will be expanding this term uh, in the coming slide. And uh, we'll understand physically what is what it means. Now, this source and sink terms on the right hand side uh, could be uh, represented like this: s input plus s nonlinear plus s white capping plus s bottom friction plus s depth induced wave breaking. So, what is s input? It takes care. Of, it is as the uh, uh, terminology indicates. It is the input input term. Like it is the wave growth by the action of wind input. Now it is the or it is a forcing term. It adds energy to the wave. Uh, now um, SNL, SNL is the nonlinear wave wave interactions. The uh, it is a uh, term which could be the nonlinear interaction could be triad wave wave interaction or the quadruplet wave wave interaction. We will explain this in the next uh, coming slides. Uh, the third term is white capping dissipation. Uh, the fourth term is. Uh, <coughs> bottom friction dissipation term and the last term is the depth induced wave breaking term that is also a dissipation term now uh, the first term or the wave growth by wind uh, we will quickly go through this because uh, this is kind of a little more descriptive um, so this uh, the transfer of wind energy to the waves is described with a resonance mechanism by phillips 1957 and a feedback mechanism by miles 1957 so according to Phillips, waves are generated by resonance between the propagating wind-induced pressure waves at, at the water surface and the freely propagating water waves, which you can see here. So this term is not very important. This is neglected or not considered in many of the wave models because this is a linear term. And this is the term which contributes to the very initial stages of the growth. Uh, so uh, most of the wave models, uh, the, this term is not uh, explicitly considered. Now, the second term is the miles term, which is a feedback term. So, uh, the uh, here you can see uh, the surface profile, profile of a wave, wave motion. And this is the wind blowing in this direction towards the east. Uh, now, the air pressure at the water surface attains a maximum on the windward side of the wave crest and a minimum on the leeward side of the 
wave crest. This implies that the wind effectively pushes the water down where the surface wave is, uh, wave surface is moving down and pulls the, uh, pulls the uh, surf, water surface up where the surface is moving up. So this is a kind of coupling between the pressure and surface motion which transfers the energy to the waves. So this is the miles term of the uh, S input or the source term, miles input. Uh, so th this transfer depends on the amplitude of the uh, water wave. It becomes more effective as the wave evolves. So that is why it is called a nonlinear term. Now, as the wave grows further and further, this mechanism becomes faster and faster, thus making the speeding up of the wave growth. So uh, in uh, this term, uh, by the generation of the wind, could be uh, is in most of the wave models, it is represented in this format as input of uh, a function of frequency and direction is equal to alpha plus beta e of f theta. This alpha and beta are uh, alpha's uh, function of uh, wind speed and beta's function of wind speed, direction, wave speed and direction. Now, the uh, basically the effect of wind on waves, I'm not going to more mathematics, the basic factors affecting the wave growth are wind speed, fetch and duration of wind. If the wind speed is greater than the wave speed, the wave will grow. If the wind speed is equal to the wave speed, the downward force on the windward side uh, and the uh, uh, upward side on the leeward side of the crest will no longer exist. If the wind speed is less than the wave speed, the uh, wind has no effect on the wave. So there is no further growth. Now, uh, we will just uh, uh, see what is the effect of each of these terms, like uh, source term. So uh, coming to this uh, wind growth term, so this is a standard John Schwartz spectrum uh, for a uh, uh, significant, uh, for a wave height of 3.5 meters. Um, and um, this, uh, this uh, figure may not be up to scale, but uh, this is a standard uh, John Schwartz spectrum and uh, you can see this shaded curve. So this is the, uh, S input term contribution uh, for a shallow water 10 meter depth uh, case and this uh, is the contribution uh, that S input term for a deep water case. So you can see that in shallow water it contributes a little more. Now the shape is uh, always, I mean the, uh, the curve, the contribution is always positive. Or, um, most of the and one more point is that uh, the most of the energy transfer from the wind to waves occurs at the at the spectral peak here because this this is the spectral peak so here this is the most of the contribution comes uh, here here also the peak of the um, contribution or s input term is here which almost coincides with this uh, so here and this on the right hand side there the contribution is more so the energy transfer mostly occurs uh, at the spectral peak and on its high frequency side. This is important point. Now, the second term in the expression is the SNL. Uh, you must be remembering this expression. This expression. So the second term is SNL. As I told you, it is the nonlinear wave wave interaction. There are two types of nonlinear wave wave interactions. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, we will first uh, mention what is the quadruplet wave wave interaction. So, this is the mechanism that affects the wave growth in deep and shallow water. That means quadruplets are uh, quadruplet wave wave interaction is present in deep water as well as shallow water. And what it does, it transfers the energy amongst the waves. It is not neither a source term, I mean, uh, uh, which contributes to the energy, nor a sink term which drains the energy. It just transfers energy amongst the waves from one wave component to another by the mechanism of resonance. So what is this resonance? This resonance condition states, uh, states that the, suppose there are four frequency components. This quadruplets can occur only, where, uh, only when at least four, com four frequencies are present. So uh, these frequencies are F1, F2, F3, F4 and corresponding wave numbers are K1, K2, K3, K4. The, uh, there is no need to bother about this equation, but just for your understanding. So uh, this uh, resonance occurs only if certain condition is satisfied. That is, this is the resonance condition, which is to be satisfied for the uh, 
uh, quadruplet wave wave interactions to be present. Now, the shape of the uh, SNL4 term or quadruplet interaction term, this is, this is a particular shape having a positive lobe here and a negative lobe here, and again a small positive lobe here at the high frequencies. Okay, so this uh, you can see that almost this is just a redistribution of energy. It takes energy from here. Uh, I mean, so from here. Uh, the <clears throat> so the significant um, fraction of a significant fraction of the wind input is uh, at the mid frequencies. So the quadruplet interactions transfer the uh, significant fraction of the wind input energy from the mid frequencies to lower frequencies. You see. Here there is a positive component. So it takes energy from this range and transfers to the lower frequency range and the higher frequency range, a little bit to the higher frequency range. This high frequencies, whatever energy is transferred, it dissipates due to wipe capping. But at the lower frequencies, this energy is fully absorbed and thus shifting the uh, peak, energy peak in, on to, uh, into the lower frequency side. So uh, after some time, any spectrum is stabilized to the Jonshaw spectrum uh, because of this nonlinear wave, wave uh, in interaction term, uh, especially the uh, quadruplet term. So this is uh, this stabilizes the shape of the wave spectrum. Now there is another term which is called triads, which is not that important normally, uh, but just for completeness, uh, this is the shape of that uh, triad interactions. This triad interactions also happens due to some resonance condition, but here there are only three wave components. This triad interaction occurs only in the very shallow water or the surf zone. So this condition is F1 plus F2 is equal to F3, K1 plus K2 equal to K3. So this transfers the energy from this area, this, this portion of the spectrum to uh, the higher harmonics or the, from the exactly from the primary peak to the super harmonic about uh, two into the peak frequency twice the peak frequency uh, um, one point you can find all these pictures everything from a textbook uh, by Holtwitzen I will give that reference towards the end of the lecture now coming to the next uh, dissipation term uh, this is a dissipation term which is a uh, which, is, which drains the energy of the waves so it is called white capping uh, you can see in this is a real picture, a real photograph. Here you can see the white cap or white hoses. It is also called white hoses. Uh, it is present in deep and shallow waters. Um, it, this uh, this term is assumed to be. This is not very clearly understood the mechanism behind this, but uh, normally it is assumed that it is dependent mainly on the wave steepness given by wave height by wave length. And in the absence of white capping, the wave heights in deep water can go unlimited. Now, uh, the, the, uh, since this is the uh, least understood of all the process affecting waves, this is mostly uh, given as a tunable coefficient in the wave model uh, equations. Uh, and in uh, this wave steepness is the quantity, uh, is the parameter which uh, controls the wave breaking in deep water. You can see this picture. Uh, this is a visually estimated fraction of breaking waves as a function of wind speed. So uh, as you can see, these are positively correlated. That means as the wind speed increases, the fraction of breaking waves also increases. White capping uh, is a phenomenon which is not only important for the evolution of the ocean waves, but this also plays a key role in the exchange of gas across the air-sea interface. We will not be discussing about this because it's not very important for us at this stage, fundamental stage. Now, coming to the shape of the white capping term. Uh, for a John Sharp spectrum. So uh, the white capping is uh, having a negative uh, 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 side, negative log only. Uh, that means it drains the energy. Uh, in deep water, uh, this is the dashed curve is the um, shape or uh, the curve for the white capping. And this shaded uh, curve is for shallow water. So in, the, in shallow water, it is more, the effect is more because of the increased steepness. Now, <clears throat> the next term, this is a uh, bottom friction term, is important only in shallow water. So what happens is uh, in shallow water, uh, the as I uh, shown you, 
in uh, the water particles move so when coming to the transitional depth the orbitals gradually uh, the orbital water particles orbitals gradually diminish you can see and finally it touches the bottom so the waves the energy is dissipated due to the friction physical friction between the bottom and the, this orbits orbital motion so finally uh, you can see it is suggested to and from motion so the, because of this uh, 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 increased friction the bottom friction happens now this is the uh, bottom friction uh, shape for a john shaw spectrum uh, so this uh, mainly depends on the uh, bottom characteristics for a for continental shelf seas with a sandy uh, seabed the dominant mechanism for the bottom uh, dissipation is the bottom friction and depends it depends on the bottom roughness grain size etc now another term which is very important for the shallow water is the depth induced wave breaking term uh, here you can see there are four types of breakers mainly spilling breaker plunging breaker uh, breaker collapsing breaker and surging breaker uh, so we will not go into the details of this type of breakers but uh, this also uh, uh, is uh, uh, happens only near to the surf zone here the me mechanism is like when the wave height by water depth attains a uh, particular ratio when it is greater than uh, 0.78 which is a threshold then this uh, depth induced wave breaking becomes very important the dissipation uh, the shape of the spectrum for this dissipation term uh, looks like this since there is no uh, th this phenomenon is not uh, there in the deep water only the shallow water curve is shown here so one important point is that the shape of this curve shape of this uh, spectrum the shape of this uh, john shaw spectrum and uh, shape of this uh, negative dissipation term uh, they are almost similar that means this uh, shape this is a shape conserving character of the depth induced wave breaking it is the shape of the john shaw spectrum is not affected by this term whereas the in the case of non linear wave wave interactions the shape of the john shaw spectrum or the peak uh, uh, shifts towards the lower frequencies that means the shape of the spectrum is affected but here the shape this is a shape conserving character now uh, this is the energy flow in a spectrum this we have already covered this is in a nutshell uh so the wind transfers energy to the mid frequencies near the peak and the mid frequencies uh, the energy gain at these frequencies is rapidly removed by the wave wave interactions which are the triads and quadruplets uh, and the energy at the intermediate frequencies is dissipated by bottom friction and surf breaking and at higher frequencies most of the energy is dissipated by white capping and surf breaking and near to the edge of the surf zone the transfer of energy from the spectral peak to its second harmonic by triad wave wave interactions is so strong that you see a secondary peak here but this is not very prominent the contribution is very less you can even uh, uh, safely neglect it uh, without uh, affecting the wave model results much significantly now this is the relate there is a table which shows the relative importance of the various processes affecting the uh, evolution of waves uh so the first process is the wind generation which is uh, now you, the three dots indicate dominant contribution uh dominant effect two dots significant but not dominant single dot of uh, minor importance and otherwise it is negligible so uh, you see the three dots this is dominant i mean wind generation that uh, contribution is dominant in oceanic waters and shelf seas and quadruplet wave interaction is dominant in oceanic waters and shelf seas and white capping is do also dominant in quadrat uh, in oceanic waters and shelf seas now bottom friction comes into action in uh, shelf seas uh, and near shore and uh, current current refraction or energy bunching they are also do um, uh, uh, important or significant uh, in near shore areas only um, then bottom friction and shoaling this uh, it is a uh, dominant Uh, only in near shore and significant in uh, shelf seas 
Now you can see the triad wave of interaction is not that dominant anywhere, anywhere, but it is significant in near shore areas, reflection and diffraction, which um, we will not be discussing much. Diffraction is uh, not considered in some of the wave models, and it is uh, 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 not that important in the normal conditions except in harbors. Now, coming to some operational wave models, uh, there is a wave model called simulating waves near shore or SWAN, which is a coastal wave model or shallow water wave model. It has structured and unstructured mesh options. Uh, I'll show you an unstructured mesh in the coming slide. This is an open source model and it's, it is Unix based. Uh, so it's freely available. Uh, and there is another model called WaveWatch 3 which is a global or deep water model. And nowadays in the latest versions, even shallow water is covered. The shallow water part is also there in the equations. And it comes, the latest versions come in structured and unstructured mesh. And it is also open sourced and uh, Unix based. And another way model is BAM, which is deep water model, which is structured, which is open source and Unix based. And another model is a MIC21 spectral waves, which is, which, uh, is regional or coastal wave model. Uh, which comes uh, in unstructured mesh or uh, the triangular mesh, which is a, this is a commercial model and it is Windows based. This is the unstructured mesh I was mentioning. Uh, see, the structured mesh which we have seen, which is rectangular in shape, uh, it is very simple to set up and does well for the coast resolutions and deep sea conditions. But what happens near the coast? In the coastal areas, in order to cover the fine uh, uh, shapes and the, uh, uh, sh uh, the uh, other features in the coastal areas, this mesh has to be very fine. So, uh, uh, making a very fine mesh, rectangular mesh for a very uh, big area, it demands a large computational resource. But if you take the unstructured mesh case, here you see these things, if you see carefully, these are uh, triangles, small triangles, and you when when you come, this is deep sea area. This is for the Bay of Bengal area, uh, and uh, near the open ocean, the triangle triangle uh, size is big. And when you come to the coastal areas, uh, the triangle size is very less, and it becomes so fine that here you see just black. This these are very fine triangles because in this in this study, the Gopalpur Vishakhapatnam area was very important. So the very fine mesh is uh, set up for this area. So this is the this is called a flexible mesh. So flexible mesh, unstructured uh, uh, mesh models are very a little complex to set up, but they are very economical. The, so because we can uh, at the desired place or region of interest, we can set uh, set up very fine resolution, uh, and in far off areas we can set up uh, coarse resolution. And uh, in case of this, uh, we need boundary conditions also in this kind of setup because these are the open boundaries, open to the ocean. Now, coming to the initial and boundary conditions, which is a requirement for the wave models. Uh, in most of the wave models, there are different types of initial conditions, different options are given. One is the calm conditions. That means the ocean is assumed that the ocean is calm in the beginning. Uh, so the wave model uh, needs uh, uh, some time to, or which is called the spin-up time, to stabilize uh, from this initial condition. Um, so it depends on the region of interest, uh, how much time it requires to stabilize the model. It, that depends on the region of interest. Now another option is the restart file from a previous model run. This is what most of the operational agencies like Incoist do. Uh, we run the wave models on a daily basis routinely. We, uh, we uh, store the restart file, we generate the restart files and store store it for the next day's model run. And every day the model run is from a restart file. Now there are two other options. Uh, we can give wave parameters from a global model as the initial condition and or initial spectra uh, is calculated from the local wind velocities. Uh, this is also another uh, option in most of the wave models. Uh, so this is not specific to any model. So in model to model, there might be slight changes. Now coming to the boundary conditions, the global wave models such as WaveWatch 3 and WAM can generate the boundary conditions or uh, normally it is two dimensional wave energy spectra. Boundary condition will be basically two dimensional energy spectra or the wave parameters for coastal models such as SWAN. Now 
what are the steps involved in the configuration of a wave modeling system? First, you have to select the appropriate wave model. It depends on your application. If you are interested in a very small area like a port or harbor, you have to go for a small scale model like SWAN. Um, and you, you have to set up a very small model for uh, which uh, preferably triangular mesh for a small area with very fine resolution. Then uh, if that area is uh, affected by, uh, like, like if it is connected to the open ocean, you have to give the boundary conditions uh, along the open uh, sea, open uh, boundary. So uh, you, if you are uh, more interested, not inter very interested in the very local phenomena, if you are interested on a global scale, then you have to go, go for a global model such as Wavewatch 3 or WAM. And um, this will not require a very fine resolution. Uh, you can just get a statistical wave parameters and uh, the overall picture. If you are going for a climate model uh, on the climate scale, you can go for a global model, global wave model. Um, so it depends on your specific application. And uh, next step is after selecting the model, you have to port it into the uh, high performance computing system or the computer of your choice. If it is an operational agency, like we are uh, in Incoes, we are using around 200 to 300 process for running the models, operational wave models uh, on everyday basis. Uh, so it depends on your application. If you are doing some research uh, application, uh, maybe you can go for lesser number of processes or a lesser uh, machines. Uh, now setting up setting up uh, the model and customization of your uh, domain of interest, preparation of initial and boundary conditions, uh, and uh, preparation of forcing fields. It is called pre-processing. And then execution of the model. It is called the model run. Um, the uh, processing of model outputs to useful forms. Uh, this, that is called post-processing then analysis and interpretation of the model output. So these are the basic steps involved in the uh, wave modeling configuration. Now these are the references. Most of, For most of the pictures like uh, the Johnson spectrum and the uh, shape of the uh, source and sink terms, I have referred to this uh, first reference, the waves in oceanic and coastal waters by Holtwitzen. So this, this uh, book is having uh, a SWAN model as one chapter. Um, and uh, that uh, even the SWAN, uh, if it is a coastal application, the SWAN the scientific and technical documentation, user manual, everything is available. And another reference is the guide to analysis and forecasting by WMO. So uh, for any other questions, you can mail me, you can reach me at sandhyakg at incoist.gov.in. Thank you. Shall I come out of the presentation? So I can I cannot see actually. How do I see the question? Is it? Yeah, somebody has asked, uh, is it necessary that the uh, total area under the curve? Uh, I think uh, the question is not very clear to me. Maybe the uh, you are referring to the um, SNL4 or the quadruplet wave wave interaction. I think so. This is the only three lobe structure I have shown. It's a question is not very clear, but uh, 
basically it is uh, zero because um, it just uh, transfers the energy from the one part of the spectrum to the other there is no positive contribution or negative contribution thought in the uh, to the total energy Uh, and um, another question what i can see is how to calculate the physical parameters like alpha peakedness value for a measured spectrum uh, so this um, as i told you i am not going deep into the equations uh, this textbook you can uh, please refer to this textbook which i have shown by holtzwitzen it is having the expression for all these um, alpha beta all these physical parameters so uh, i don't want to go into the details of the equations I told you I am not going deep into the equations. Uh, this textbook you can uh, please refer to this textbook which I have shown by Holtzwitzen. It is having the expression for all these um, alpha, beta, all these physical parameters. So uh, I don't want to go into the details of the equations. I am not going deep into the equations. Uh, this textbook, you can uh, please refer to this textbook which I have shown by Holtzwitzen. It is having the expression for all these um, alpha, beta, all these physical parameters. So uh, I don't want to go into the details of the equations. going deep into the equations uh, this is textbook you can uh, please refer to this textbook which i have shown by holtzwitzen it is having the expression jitu next we started ah sir sir one minute sir can, can you see the, can you see the screen the ppt yeah yeah no sir you can share ppt sir you can't see yeah now it is can you make it full screen sir Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. How about now? You can see it in full screen. Yeah, sir, full screen. Okay. Man, there is presentation, man. This is it, co. A folder. Ah, the PDF. First one. Fundamentals of wave modeling PDF document. And you take only PDF document. Yeah. Sir, can you show me, sir? We'll start around twelve five. Twelve five, okay. Just tell me. Ah, okay, sir. Sir, can you preview now your presentation? Okay, sir. We'll start, sir. Start करेंगे सर तो अनम्यूट करो सर आपका माइक
আমাকে দেখা দিচ্ছে আর গোলটিও এইভাবে করি এবার এখানে জাস্ট না এখানে জিতু ক্যান এনিবডি রেসপন্ড I don't see the list of participants, how many participants? Ah, okay. So sorry for this slight delay. So we'll talk about the basic concepts of ocean data assimilation. I don't know how many of you are, uh, are aware of this uh, concept of data assimilation. Uh, this involves a little bit of mathematics. I have tried to keep it as basic as possible so that uh, you know participants from all backgrounds can have a hang of it. What this ocean data assimilation or rather any data assimilation is, uh, how it is done through some simple basic examples. And then eventually if time permits, how it is done in uh, in inquiries particularly but even if i am unable to uh, show you how it is done in inquiries there is another lecture tomorrow at the same time where you will be shown like how how it is actually done in an operational agency like inquiries now one of the basic you know concepts that we have to kind of understand and something that we know but we kind of forget or ignore is something that the great mathematician Gosh he realized around 200 years back that you see whatever observations we make those observations are not truth all observations they come with certain errors okay so if the observation has error because obviously there will be some instrumentation error associated with the observations. So if your observations have error, then whatever deductions you make using those observations, they have to have errors. Okay, so that's the first basic concept that we all should understand that not only the models that we use across oceanography, meteorology, hydrology, any anything any any model uh, has errors just like that observations also has errors and the truth the actual truth is unknown to us so uh, so what we do then uh, what we do is that we try to combine our knowledge of observation and our knowledge of models and try to come up with an estimate which is closer to the truth than either observation is or model is. Now there's a lot unlike observations in general there are a lot of scope for models to have errors and the reasons vary. The reasons can be because of you know poorly known initial conditions it can be because uh, the dynamics 
that we have written for the model we do not understand the entire dynamics completely and maybe we have parameterized the uh, dynamics we have made some approximations in the dynamics or there are problems for example in ocean models so ocean models are typically forced with atmospheric fluxes now those atmospheric fluxes for example the winds the radiation the surface air temperature whatever forcing that we provide to the ocean models those forcings itself might have errors also the model so when we uh, uh, when we write a model or when we try to solve a model what we do is we try to you know uh, make grids or create grids so if you create a grid let's say uh, so it's like discretizing the system so if you discretize the system then you are not actually solving the model equations at each and every point on the ocean rather you are solving it at certain let's say evenly spaced locations and those evenly spaced locations that can vary according to the resolution of the model so if it's a let's say a quarter degree model a 1 by 4 degree model then these are around 25 kilometers apart which essentially means that whatever is happening within that 25 kilometers you are not very sure about it also because you have introduced a certain length scale of 25 kilometers in your model dynamics you cannot actually resolve all the uh, length scales that your theoretical equation has so there are these are some of the limitations of the model and because of these limitations there are errors in general uh, the observation the errors in observations are less than the model but remember this both of them both the observation and the model none of it is the truth so truth is something that is unknown and what data assimilation does is that it has observations it has model so it takes information from the observation it takes information from from the model and then it statistically mixes up in such a way that we come up with a state in this case let's say a ocean state we come up with a ocean state so that it is closer to the truth than either the observations or the model so when i say the ocean state then i am talking about ocean state variables which are independent of each other so in an ocean uh, ocean dynamics three dimensional ocean dynamics there are certain ocean state variables for example temperature salinity your velocities your uh, sea level height these are the ocean state variables and when i talk about the ocean state i say that if these variables are known to me then i can deduce everything about the ocean the physical ocean not the bio biogeochemical part by the way so this is something uh, a schematic diagram of the flow chart of data assimilation so what it does if you do not assimilate data if you just run the model okay so what happens is that you start with an incorrect initial condition which is not very precise okay and what happens is that because of the non linearity in the dynamics these dynamics are typically a little chaotic a typical non linear so when you start with a little further away from the very true initial condition the model starts to drift apart from reality or from truth however after certain time you have observations so these red dots they represent observations and this uh, solid orange line that you see is the model if you do not do anything to the model and the green solid line is the truth so if you do not do anything from uh, to the model if you do not correct it then what happens is that the model drifts away then sometimes it close comes close to the truth and again drifts away things like this keep on happening 
But if you have observations, then using data assimilation, you can try to constrain the model from drifting away. You can you can kind of bring it close to the truth. So what happens is that this black line is what uh, is the black line shows the model dynamics when it starts. So it moves according to the model dynamics. Then suddenly at certain point of time there is an observation. The first red dot on this chart to the left. So once you have this observation, what it does using data assimilation, it then uh, takes that model. It is it then uh, you know arrays the divergence of this model and then brings it closure to the truth. So this dotted line is what is the new initial condition or the model you get after data assimilation. And the model again starts from here, from this place. And again, it starts evolving according to the model dynamics. Then after a certain time, again, you have one observation. This observe then again, uh, we assimilate and again, we kind of pull back the model and bring it kind of closer to the truth and let it evolve again. So this is how it typically goes on. So there are there are two methods in which uh, data assimilation is done. And both of these methods are kind of, you know, there are two approaches, uh, but both of these approaches, they converge at the end. So one of this approach is like finding maximum likelihood using Bayes theorem. And the other one is minimize the cost function. So I'll talk about what is Bayes theorem here. Uh, and I will try to kind of simplify it as much as possible without getting into much mathematical details. So what does Bayes theorem say? So it, it is a theorem based on probability. So let's say I want to find the probability of finding A given that there is B. Okay, in this case, let's say I want to find the probability of the ocean state given that there is an observation. This is equal to a conditional probability of B given A times the probability of A with no knowledge of B divided by the probability of B with no knowledge of A. Now we'll try to understand it through some examples and the very basic example. So this example is about betting on horses. Okay. So I am not encouraging any of you to bet on horses, but then let's say that uh, someone amongst us is inclined to bet on horses. So what are the what is the knowledge that I have? So let's say there are two horses. One horse is called Fleetfoot. The other horse is called Bolt. Uh, so out of the twelve races that these two horses have run together. Fleetfoot have won in seven of the races and Bolt has won in five of the races. So given only this information, if I am to bet on horse, I'll be betting on Fleetfoot because the probability of Fleetfoot winning is seven out of 12, which is 58.3%. Whereas the probability of Bolt winning is just five out of 12, which is 41%. So why should I bet on Bolt? Rather, I will bet on Fleetfoot. However, if I now add another information in the system, let's say that out of the five wins that Bolt had on three days, it was raining. And on and uh, Built and, and Bolt lost only once when it was raining. Okay, so out of 12 days, four days it was raining, and out of four days, on three days, Bolt won, and on one day, Bolt lost. Okay, so there are 12 number of races. On four days it was raining. On eight days it was sunny. And on the four days that it was raining, Bolt 
won three of its five wins. Okay. Now let's say on the day of the betting, when you are going to make the bet, there is a rain. Okay. So it is raining. Given this new condition or this new information, what is the probability of bolt winning? So once you know this information, you know that bolt has won three out of four times when it was raining. Okay, and two out of six times when it was not raining. So the probability of bolt winning, given that it is now raining, is simple. It's just three by four or seventy-five percent. Earlier the probability was something like. 41.7%. Now it has jumped to 75%. Given this new information that it is raining today, if given a choice, I will definitely bet on bolt. Okay? And you should too. You should not back Fleetfoot when it rains. If we do the same thing using Bayes theorem, what are we going to do? So the probability of bolt winning when it rains is what we want to find out. Okay. Now the probability of raining when bolt wins is three out of five. Out of five days, three days it was raining. Out of five wins on three uh, days it was raining. So it's three by five. The, what is the probability of bolt winning given that I have no knowledge of rain? Then it is. Bolt has won five times out of the twelve races it had competed. So it's five by twelve. And what's the total number of days it ran? It 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 rained in uh, uh, out of twelve days. It's four. So the probability of raining is four by twelve. So what is the probability of bolt winning when it rains? Is p of b slash a, which is three by five. Into p of a, which is 5 by 12, divided by p of b, which is 4 by 12. Again, you get 3 by 4 or 75 percent. So this is the concept of Bayes theorem. Okay. So when a new information comes in, then we get into something called a conditional probability, and we try to see what uh, information we can glean from this new information and how things change. Similarly, in data assimilation, you run a model, okay, and then if you do not look at any observations, then you can simply run that model, and that model will, with time, drift apart from reality. But when observation comes, you have a new information, and you try to assimilate that information in the system, this new information, information of observation, and then you come up with a better. Ocean state, or a better atmospheric state, or better whatever state that you are looking at. So now we'll get into the basics of data assimilation. So in uh, so in this case, I will just concentrate, let's say, on a ocean model. So like I said before, all ocean models, in order to solve these ocean models on a computer, we have no choice but to discretize this ocean. By discretization, I mean you will be solving the ocean dynamics at certain grid points, not at all the points on this ocean. So, in this right-hand side, you can see a lattice-like structure numbered as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So, these are the points, let's say, on which I am solving my ocean state. And by ocean state, let's say x x of b. Is my background ocean state, okay? So background. So there are certain terminologies. So background ocean state is the ocean state that you have before assimilation, okay? Which means, over here, at the top of this uh, dotted line in the flowchart of data assimilation diagram that we have. So. This is your background ocean state. Okay, this is your observation. Okay, so I'll come back again to this basic slide. Uh, so my XB, XB is 
the background ocean state which has let's say temperature salinity uh, the two currents u and v and sea level uh, height and your k k denotes the time so your xpk let's say is the current background ocean state and m is an operator which acts on this xpk your current ocean state and takes you to the next time step at k plus 1 to give you the background ocean state at the time k plus 1 and there is a certain error involved with it which is denoted by epsilon b so this first equation it talks to you about the model dynamics the second y of k plus 1 is the observation at k plus 1 y denotes the observation at k plus 1 x b of k plus 1 is your background ocean state at time k plus 1 and your h h is an operator which when acts on your background ocean state and takes you to the observation space so here you can see two maroon dots and then there is a blue dot now we have to keep in mind that when we install observations let's say i have installed an in situ observation in the ocean not necessarily that in situ observation will fall right on the ocean grid so this blue dot may be placed somewhere in between two ocean dots okay however i solve my equations only on this maroon dots so what how do i use this uh, information of observation which is placed somewhere in between two grid points then i kind of take that observation information and bring it to those model grid points okay how that observation is going to what the observe let's say what that observation is going to be when it is kind of interpolated quote unquote interpolated on those model grid points now remember that like i said before the observation and the model both of them has errors in it okay and this error characteristics is very important in data simulation so there are certain assumptions we make to make our life simple one of the assumption is that the model and the observation is unbiased which essentially means that the mean of these errors both the model uh, error and the observation error is zero over multiple realizations also the model and the observation error they are uncorrelated one does not influence the other and the error covariances the model error covariances so how the error at one location in the model is going to affect the error at some other location that is not trivial that in the model error covariance we we denote it by let's say p a quantity and in the observation error covariance we denote it by r both these quantities b and r this error covariances they are very important in data assimilation and we will show you how it is so, so again we go back to the base theorem and i will not get into much of this details of this mathematics because i am not sure like how uh, how fluent all of you are in mathematics just keep in mind that at the end of the day what we do is that we minimize this j of x so this j of x is what is called the cost function either we minimize this j of x or we maximize this probability p of x bar y either of this so like in the beginning i said there are two methods of approach one is the least square approach minimizing and the other is finding the maximum likelihood so when you try to estimate p then you go for finding the maximum likelihood and when you try to find out uh, when you try to minimize the cost function then you go for j so both are identical maximizing p 
is same as minimizing j and once you do all this mathematics once you try to minimize j you end up with this boxed equation boxed by this green solid line where we are saying that x of a which is the new ocean state in data simulation this is called analysis remember this this is called ocean analysis or uh, it for oceans we will say ocean analysis for atmosphere we will say atmospheric analysis for whatever it is analysis so that's why the sub uh, that's why there is a superscript a so x of a which is the ocean analysis is equal to x of b which is the ocean background just before assimilation plus this term so there is another term b of h transpose into h b h transpose plus r whole inverse then y of y minus h of x b y is your observation so this is the primary equation across many data assimilation methods particularly least square methods that is being followed uh so this cost function if you look at it this cost function is actually parabolic in nature and what we try to do we are at some ocean state so think of it like a bowl okay this uh, the cost function the shape of this cost function is like a bowl like a cup and then you were at some at some place at the side of the cup at one of the uh side of the cup and all you want is to reach at the bottom of the cup and that is what is done when you do a uh, try to minimize the cost function your idea is to reach to the bottom of the cup and that is typically done using some computer method called steepest descent now what are the popular data assimilation methods there are many many data assimilation methods that uh, you will keep on hearing uh, but there uh, are a, uh, so these are the list of some uh, data assimilation methods one is a kalman filter okay this approach is a very very robust data assimilation method the problem with this is that uh, it is very good if your system is small if the system size if you are doing it for a very very small region or if this is mostly used you will get to see uh, hear it in electrical circuits where the ocean states they are simple they are not very long uh, they are not very high dimension what happens for uh, ocean is that the ocean state the dimension of this ocean state itself is in uh, 10 to the power 6 10 to the power 7 in in millions the dimension and when the dimension is in million your model error covariance which is a matrix so it becomes a million by million matrix and it, at some place you have to invert this matrix so there is a matrix inversion that takes place and uh, the kind of computational cost and resources that is needed uh, that is not possible so that's why people particularly in meteorology and in oceanography none of the operational centers they use kalman filter even though it's a robust method we do not have the computational resources to use kalman filter there is another method called 3d var so in 3d var your uh, model error statistics be it's that stationary it's static so you uh, feed to the data assimilation system some model error statistics and that statistics that does not evolve in time so that makes life a little easier in 4d var that is another popular uh, data assimilation method the you allow your model error covariance matrix b to evolve within the time window of cost function minimization so what happens is that you choose a time window let's say about 2 days 3 days 5 days that depends on your priority and within that time window you let your uh, model error covariance evolve but the problem with 4d var is that 
it is also very computationally expensive but then uh, but it is manageable there are some operational agencies that uses 4d bar this is also a good data assimilation method another data assimilation method is ensemble based kalman filter in this case you do not let p evolve with model dynamics uh, you, you do not estimate it from there what you estimate it from the ensembles so once you have the ensemble by ensemble you mean that uh, you have identical copies of the model all these copies they evolve at the same time so let's say you have 20 or 40 or 60 identical copies of the model and the 60 models all the all these models they are evolving in time and using these 60 models you try to estimate your model error covariance the problem with this is that your model error covariance is not exact unlike kalman filter it is just an approximate and the more number of copies you can make in this ensemble the more number of ensembles we can you can work with your p gets better and better but then also you will need more number of computers more computational resources so somewhere in between we need to optimize there is somewhere a cutoff beyond which you will say that okay i have enough number of ensemble members and whatever b i am getting from this this is good enough for me so like i said uh, the model error covariance and the observation error covariance both of these are very important and both of these play a very important role during data assimilation and we'll try to understand it through some simple very simple examples okay so this has as of now nothing to do with oceanography uh, let's say we just try to estimate the temperature of hyderabad at some place uh, let's say the temperature of the room that you are sitting in and i run some model to get the temperature i solve some dynamical equation and then after solving the dynamical equation i say that my model is predicting this temperature of 31 degree centigrade okay and the error covariance that is associated with the model is about 2 degree centigrade so essentially what i am saying is my model is predicting 31 degree centigrade with an error of 2 which means it can be somewhere in between 29 and 33 so the larger this p is the more uncertain you are about the estimate that your model is providing a good model a very good model will have a small p will have a small error covariance a bad model will have a large error covariance okay now let's say i also measure the temperature of your room using a thermometer what i find is that my thermometer is showing that there is the temperature of your room is 30 degree centigrade and let's say the error of the thermometer is 1 degree centigrade which means it can be somewhere between 29 and 30 degree uh, 31 degree centigrade that's what my observation is predicting in this case i am measuring the temperature uh, at the same point at which my model has predicted the temperature for such a case the h is 1 and my r is 1 my p is 2 in such a uh, if given this what is going to be my model analysis after data assimilation what am i going to get so i plug in all these values to the equations on the top so my x a is going to be x b plus my b is sigma b square h is 1 then sigma b square bracket h b h transpose again h and h transpose both are 1 so b is sigma b square plus r is sigma 0 square 
inverse of this bracket and y is y0 minus xp h is anyway 1 so when i when i solve this what i see is that my xa is sigma 0 square divided by sigma 0 square plus sigma b square xb plus sigma b square divided by sigma 0 square plus sigma b square into y0 so when i plug in those values what i see is that the xa is 30.33 so after data assimilation this 30.33 is a better estimate of the temperature of your room other than uh, either from uh, observation or from your model. So my observation predicted 30, my observation showed me 30, my model showed me 31, whereas the analysis is somewhere in between, is 30.33. The analysis also tells you that the error associated with this analysis, I have not shown you the, um, the equation on how to estimate the sigma a square, the analysis error covariance. So that is 0 0.8. So now what we see, we have come up with a better estimate of the temperature of the room. Not only that, we can say that the temperature of the room is 30.33 plus minus 0 0.8. Earlier we were saying 30 plus minus 0 0.1, even the certainty with which the, observe, uh, the uh, certainty with which you were uh, observing it had a variance of about plus minus 1 degree centigrade. After analysis, you are more certain that after data assimilation, you are more certain that the temperature of this room is 30.33 plus minus 0 0.8, which means you have gone closer to the truth. Now look at this final equation, which is xa equals to sigma 0 square divided by sigma 0 square plus sigma b square into xb plus sigma b square divided by sigma 0 square plus sigma b square into y0. So in this equation, let's say you have your sigma b, which is the model error covariance, which is much, much larger than sigma 0, which means the model is not that good. The model is bad and you have a very good observation. You are more certain about the observation and you are very uncertain about the model. In such case, what this is going to do, the analysis will be as simple as y0 or the observation, which means the data simulation system is going to ignore the model because through sigma b square, you are saying that I do not have much faith on the model because it is large. The error associated with the model is large. Since I do not have much faith on the model, the data assimilation system will choose to have more confidence on the observations and will kind of shift, the analysis will shift towards the observation. The analysis will be very close to the observation value that you provide. If it's the other way around, if you say that whatever I have observed, I observed it with a very faulty instrument. There is a large error associated with whatever I have observed. And comparatively, there is much smaller error associated with the model. In such case, the data assimilation system will rely more on the model, for model predictions than the observations. And will rely heavily on the model result and will shift x and the analysis will be something which you will find to be very close to your uh, to your model so these two error covariances they act as weights okay weights on how to distribute the analysis or how to bring the analysis either closer to the observation or closer to the uh, model. So it's very important to try to correctly estimate these error covariances. Also, like I said, so these all are Gaussian curves. So when you say that I observed 30 degree centigrade with a error of about one, a standard deviation of about one. So this red curve is depicting that. 
so what i have observed is 30 degree which is the mean of this curve at 30 degree and then there is a standard deviation of about 1 degree centigrade associated with it so this curve is a little spikier compared to the model which is the green curve you started with you said that i observed it to be 31 degree centigrade which is the mean of this green curve however there is a larger error associated with it a larger standard deviation that's why this green curve is much flatter than the red curve that you have that is associated with the observation at the end of the day i come up with an analysis which is cl closer to the truth which is something like 30.33 and which is sharper than both the observation and the model that is the standard deviation associated with this blue curve is smaller than both the standard deviation associated with the model and the standard deviation associated with the green curve so some more exercises uh, how much time do i have another 15 minutes <clears throat> so let's say i have a rod okay so this signifies those blue two blue dots on the right hand side of this slide signifies the two end of that rod and i have a model which predicts the temperature of or uh, let's say the temperature of these two ends x1b and x2b however when i try to measure the temperature of the rod i measure it somewhere in between uh, depicted by the red dot so my y0 is the observation my x1b and x2b are the model predicted values at the two end of this rod i want to find out what the uh, 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 what the analysis is i will again like to reiterate that neither x1b nor y0 nor x2b represents the truth our aim is to move closer to the truth using all these observations using x1b using y0 and using y2b okay so i would like to know what is my improved estimate of temperature at these two ends of the rod okay so when i observe a point somewhere in between two grid two end points of the rod or between let's say two grid points then my h xb my y is h of xb which is uh, alpha x1b plus 1 minus alpha x2b so what does alpha signify alpha signifies where exactly in between these two you are measuring let's say if alpha is 0 if alpha is 0 then your h x1b is simply x2b which means you are measuring right at the right end of the rod if alpha is 1 then you have only x1b and you are measuring right at the left end of the rod or the left grid point and if alpha is somewhere between 0 and 1 then you are measuring somewhere in between these two grid points or in between uh, somewhere on the rod now let us say we assume now we have two grid points so the model error covariance in this case will be a 2 by 2 matrix a 2 by 2 symmetric matrix error covariances are always symmetric by symmetric i mean in this case your these two diagonal elements b11 and b12 they can vary but b12 and b21 they will be same so what does b12 and b21 signify b12 signify is what is the correlation error correlation of this of point 1 with respect to point 2 and b21 is what is the error correlation of point 2 with respect to point 1 these two are identical 
the way one affects two is the same way in which two affects one. So that's why your error covariances B is a symmetric matrix. And we assume that it is sigma B square, sigma B square, mu sigma B square, mu sigma B square as the elements of this matrix. We'll keep things simple to understand. So just like that, we have to solve, we are trying to solve this red box equation at the top of the slide. So if you solve it, okay, using this B and using R equals to sigma zero square, you will, uh, you will come at this equation at the bottom of the slide. So that you can see x1a and x2a equals to x1b, x2b plus sigma b square plus there are other terms. Okay. Now let's say I make things further simple. So the whole exercise of this is to understand what does B and R do. Okay. So let's say there is no cross correlation between two grid points. Mu equals to 0 and alpha equals to 1. So when I say mu equals to 0 and alpha equals to 1, what am I saying? So I'll come back to the previous slide and I'll show. So when mu equals to 0, what I'm saying is the grid point 1 is in no way influencing anything in grid point 2, which means these two off diagonal elements will be 0. Mu is 0 means these two off diagonal elements is 0. And your B is sigma b square times an identity matrix that's it also i am saying alpha equals to one alpha equals to one means in this case i am just you know uh, observing x1 b observing the same location where x1 b is being predicted in such a case what i see is that my analysis at the other end at x to b is remains unchanged. Whatever I have observation, that observation does not in any way affect the other end of the rod. And the left end of the rod that gets modified using the observations just like what we had in the previous example of finding out the analysis of the room temperature. Same. Okay. However, if you let mu not to be zero, let's say I keep everything same and I have just made mu not equals to zero. Mu not equals to zero means my point one, the left end of that rod, the error of the layer, the left end of the rod affects the information at the right end of the rod. Okay. So if mu is non-zero, then what I see is the right end of the rod gets affected from or the right the analysis at the right end of the rod is x to b plus there is a correction term even though i have observed only the left end of the rod my thermometer was there only on the left end of the rod but just because my left in the model my left end of the rod is influencing the right end of the rod this information percolates from one grid point to the other grid point so remember the uh, one of the major importance of b the model error covariance the background error covariance is to spread information from one grid to the other so that's the reason even if you have, let's say, uh, you observe the ocean only at certain specific locations. Okay, let's say I have a model for the Bay of Bengal and I have certain in situ buoys in the Bay of Bengal. Let's say I have 10 scattered in situ buoys in the Bay of Bengal and I assimilate these in situ buoys. Now, these in situ buoys, they do not only improve your ocean model estimate at the place of their installation, 
blood, but this improvement is spread across the entire Bay of Bengal. So <clears throat> that is why and how and what determines this spread? This spread is determined by the background error covariance. And this is the reason why we should be very careful about trying to estimate the right background error covariance. Okay. The other problem, so there are certain practical issues that are associated with data assimilation. Okay. One of the practical issues that I have already talked about is that for oceanography or for meteorology, we are actually dealing with very large system sizes. And because of this large system sizes, we need a lot of computational resources. And with time, we are also like, so there is kind of, you know, a competition going on. We are improving on our computational resources. We are producing faster and faster processes. At the same time, we are also uh, improving on the resolution of the model. Earlier, 20 years back, people used to be happy if they could run a quarter degree model with 25 kilometer grid spacing. Today, if you look at major operational agencies, they talk about of a two kilometer grid spacing, which means one by 48 degree. And which means within a short region, you are solving that computer, solving that model equations at multiple grid locations. And that takes time. Not only that, your model error covariance also grows exponentially. And this gets very, very, very difficult. So this is, there are ways to handle it uh, by approximating, by going into ensemble methods or things like that. But these are the practical issues that we um, in the data assimilation, assimilation community face. There is another practical issue that we face. You remember this curve? When we, this curve is the same curve that we had when we were estimating the, you know, uh, the room temperature. With data assimilation, what happens is that the good thing is you are able to say it with a lot of certainty. Okay. So, particularly in inquiries, what we do is we assimilate using ensemble. A Kerman filter. That's one of the methods. So we run various ensembles. Now, once we do that assimilation, we know that we can say the temperature of that location with better certainty. But the problem is that there is these ensembles. They come. They start coming closer and closer to each other. And there is a time when all the ensembles they collapse onto each other this is called in data simulation language this is called model divergence a filter divergence okay so in such scenario in order to avoid this we employ something called a covariance inflation so once we know that okay so this the temperature of this is 30.33 with an accuracy of 0 0.8 after this we artificially inflate the ensembles and then we let the model run again we let the entire cycle to go on to continue again so covariance inflation is necessary at times not always another problem that we face or another concept that is very widely used across all data simulation method is this concept of idea of localization. Now, let's say uh, you are uh, you are running a global model and you are assimilating somewhere, uh, assimilating an observation at the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But remember that this observation 
information this can spread through your model error covariance across all the locations that you have which means your information at the central pacific due to assimilation will reach somewhere in the arctic will reach somewhere in bay of bengal will reach somewhere in the antarctic ocean unless you do something to restrict that we all know that the that the observation at specific should not in any way affect the observation or affect the ocean state let's say in the bay of bengal because they are quite unrelated so in order to restrict this something called the idea of local localization has been put forward so what happens is that that observation will only influence your model states some something within that falls within the radius of this localization so in data assimilation we need to prescribe the localization radius and once you prescribe the localization radius the observation is only going to influence model states that fall within the localization radius now i don't think i have time for this practical applications in invoice uh uh but then uh, tomorrow at the same time someone will uh, balaji will talk about uh what we do and in quiz do remember all this theory and everything when you kind of try to look at the practical applications of data assimilation in in quiz tomorrow at 12 thank you all so are there any questions so jitu how do i how do i address the questions in youtube jitu jitu are there I suppose the participants are asking questions. I don't know. Like, guys, I am unable to unable to see any questions. Uh, coming. Okay. Three questions. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Uh, now I can see the questions. Uh, so let's try to first. Uh, so the first question is: Are these PPTs available online on portal? Uh, are these available? Yes, these are available. so you can uh, simply uh, get this ppts or you can even send me a mail if you do not get it my email id is arya paul at inquiries.gov.in so if you send me a email i can also send you these ppts okay the next question is how do you correct errors in the observation okay so errors in the observation is not corrected using data assimilation if this is what you wanted to ask so errors in the observation they are you can correct by improving your instruments or by some other means but not using data assimilation so data assimilation is used mostly to correct errors in the model uh then there is some question from joydev sardar how to extract sea level rise data from satellite altimeter so uh sea level rise data you can uh, these are easily available if you go to abyso websites 
you can uh, are you talking of sea level anomaly data or sea level rise data if you are talking of the trend then you have to work a little harder sea level trend if by sea level rise you mean uh, the sea level anomaly then the aviso they have a something called a geoid and from that geoid or mean dynamic topography they come up with and from that mean dynamic topography they get the sea level uh, rise uh, but then you do not need to do all these exercises sea level anomaly data is easily available from aviso you just type aviso data there are apdrc sites from where you can get this uh, sea level rise or sea level anomaly data so i'm guessing by sea level rise you mean sea level anomaly then there is uh, another uh, question from vaishnavi when the sample size are not same for a given two data sets then how to correlate or assimilate the data uh, what strategy can be used to explain one data set is better than that of other okay so let's first talk about the first question when the sample size are not same for a given two data sets see uh, this is what i have been talking about so uh, uh, the ocean model so when you talk about the ocean model the ocean model sample size is huge it uh, it uh, solves your uh, it solves the ocean at multiple multiple grid locations in comparison your observations are sparse hugely sparse compared to your model so the sample size of the observation and the model so these two are two different data sets let's say the model and the observation okay then for these two different data sets we can see that the sample size are very different in such a case then how do we correlate or assimilate the data this is how we assimilate the data this is what the entire lecture is about you assimilate the observation the smaller sample size to the larger sample size in this case the model if you want to do the other way around let's say you want to use the model to as if uh, to uh, have a better estimate at the, see at the end of the day we are use what we want we want a best, better estimate of temperature either from observation or from model or using both observation and model using data simulation so this is what data simulation does i don't know whether i have been able to answer your question or not i'm not sure i don't understand how to correlate or assimilate the data so i think uh, i gave you the formula to assimilate the data like how to do that the next question is what strategy can be used to explain one data set is better than that of other okay so it all depends like uh, what do you mean uh by better so you want, when you say that one data set is better than the other then you have to have you know some reference data set with which you are going to compare so i don't know what exactly this question is about uh but then i'm i'm sure there are very many uh, uh statistical methods to you know to kind of uh uh compared to data sets that you can always look up to i do not see any other questions but if you have any question even later on uh, you can always uh, send those questions to me via email my email is a r y a p a u l at the red incoes i n c o i s dot g o v dot i n i'll be happy to respond to these questions okay thank you thank you all i do not see any other questions